session on giving serious consideration to race, culture, and equity. I'm, I'm very glad you decided to come to this session <laughs> instead of tea time. Um, so it, I think it's been clear for some time that motivation um, scholarship really needs to give some serious consideration to race, culture, and equity. Um, and be more inclusive of and applicable to the experiences of people from a diverse set of backgrounds and cultures and races. Um, I have really very little doubt that most, if not all of you, would agree about this communal goal. Um, and, but we have a lot of work uh, to, to meet it, right? We have a lot of work to meet this challenge. So the aim of this session today is to encourage reflection, reflection, to inspire, and to challenge our motivation and education community of scholars um, to make strides towards this goal. And so with that, I'm really thrilled that we have a really terrific panel of experts to do just that. So please help me welcome our panelists and discussants. Let me, oops, let me put their names up. Um, in order of presentation, I have here Jessica DeCure Gumby uh, joining us from North Carolina State University, uh, Jamal Sharif Matthews joining us from Montclair State University, uh, Ellen Usher from the University of Kentucky, um, Ranelle King from um, uh, the Education University of Hong Kong, and our discussant, Akani Zusha, will lead us in an interactive discussion with the panelists. So the format today is each of these Panelist is going to give you a 15 minute or so presentation, um, sharing their perspective and experiences and their own work, and then Akani will discuss with them some of their thoughts on this topic. So, thank you, and let's give them a big round of applause. Um, first, I want to talk to you a little bit about who I am personally and how it's influenced kind of my work. I, I am, so a little about family. Um, I'm from Louisiana. And um, Louisiana has a really interesting racial um, background, particularly in region Louisiana. If historically, um, you know, particularly during times of slavery, you had a three-tier system. Unlike many southern um, states, you had, um, of course, you had um, whites and you had um, black Africans, but you also had a third group of people we call free people of color. And so you always had a very interesting racial mixture going on there. And they're also known as Creole people. And so my family comes, I come from uh, on both sides of my family, Heritage, in particular, I just did my DNA uh, from um, who created me, and actually, about you know, it's a really interesting mix. I'm actually, 59% of European heritage, and so which is really interesting in terms of my doing racial identity work. Um, so, mathematically, I'm more white than I am black, but that's a whole different discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow, race has always been very interesting to me in my whole family and um, my experiences, and so also my educational experiences. Race has been very interesting to me. I um, went to Louisiana State University, which is of course is a PWI. And, um, and so we had a small group of um, um, African American students there as well. But we, had, we were a very tight niche group of uh, students there. But and so race was also important there. I was also a psychology and Spanish double major there. And so culture became very important as you know, I got really involved in, in, in my Spanish major and got to learn, um, know a lot of the Spanish um, professors well and got very involved in Spanish culture. Then I moved to, um, to the University of Georgia for my master's and PhD. That was another PWI, but a totally different PWI because um, race is very different in Georgia than it was in Louisiana. Um, when I got to Georgia, the state of Georgia, you have to remember when I went to graduate school um, in um, the late 90s, early 2000s, the state flag still had the Confederate flag as the part of the state flag of Georgia. So it was very different. Um, you know, in, uh, at LSU, if um, a fraternity the uh, Confederate flag, they may, got, may have gotten in trouble. When I got to Georgia, they had the Confederate flag all over their chest and walked around proudly and boldly. So it was a totally different view of race to me and the way it's looked at. And so um, at UGA, I actually got exposed to a lot of racial identity theories, particularly in my work and my reading. And that's when I really first learned about critical race theory in my, my research. Um, and I should have one there at NC State is where I really um, began to really dig more deeply into critical race theory. Um, and so my whole program of research has been exploring race and race um, in a variety of ways, looking at race and racial identity development, particularly whether it's an adolescent, develop, uh, adolescent um, issues or whether um, emerging adults, particularly in college, 
um, or even workplaces. I've actually done some work with people in the racial community, particularly um, among African Americans in, um, in working environments. Um, race and emotions and emotional regulation. I've looked at race and research methods, and most specifically looking at qualitative methods or mixed methods research or looking at race in terms of critical race theory. And I'm also, um, also focusing on looking at race in terms of how we as a field in education and psychology should be moving in terms of talking about issues of race. Um, so I've been talking about race for, for years, particularly in terms of, of my research. And so today, I'm gonna to talk a little bit more about the work I'm actually doing, um, looking at the influence of race, particularly in um, a high school and some work that I've been doing, particularly in the science context. Um, and so in this work, particularly, and we're looking at, um, um, we want to explore students' interest in developing their science and um, uh, science identity and career in, um, in STEM. And so particularly how students, uh, whether or not they wanted to, um, you know, in, in, when they graduate from high school, whether they want to actually engage in a career in STEM. And so we actually looked at a variety of uh, literature in terms of social, cognitive, career, and career choice, um, which kind of, uh, looking at this model, looks at whether or not enjoying science is simply not enough to encourage students to engage in science, they need to develop a science identity. So whether or not, you know, it, you just can't just say, hey, you know, you know, do you want to, you know, be uh, a scientist? They actually have to have a science identity. So we're um, uh, framing our work in that area. Also looking at racial ethnic identity, particularly uh, for students of color, cultural barriers also impact the whole science identity model. And so, uh, you know, there is a link between racial and ethnic identity and academic achievement, and so students with positive racial and ethnic identities are more likely to be academically successful. So we want to look at that as well. Also, parents have the ability to promote healthy identity development in their children um, by instilling socialization methods, um, messages. So we also want to look at how parents socialize their kids to not only you know want to engage in careers in science, but also how they impact their racial and ethnic identity development. And then um, the last one, we look at the relationship between students and their science teachers because we thought, you know, it's also really important because if the teachers don't necessarily believe in their students that they can actually do science, the students won't necessarily believe they can actually do science and have careers in science. And so also looking at that role between um, the, the students and their science teachers. And so we thought that all these groups too would be important to guide their um, guide our study. So we also want to look at this from a critical frame. So we use critical race theory which places race as the center focus and, and explores transformations of the relationship between race, racism, and power. And particularly, there, there are several different tenets of critical race theory, but we want to focus on um, whiteness as property, which really looks at the evidence of advantage of white privilege, um, white privilege, particularly if you're thinking about STEM um, context, you know, you think about that, those are very white spaces. Um, and then also color blindness, which looks at the way to disregard race, how race doesn't matter. Um, and focusing on this conscious racism, which is the uncritical ways of thinking about race and racism and kind of accepting the racial uh, status quo. And so those are the ways we want to frame our study and look at things. And so for our methodology, we did a conversion parallel design, you know, focusing most, mostly on quantitative research, but quantitative methods, but also looking at some qualitative aspects. And for our sample, we used three STEM academies, one racial diverse and two predominantly white. We have 149 9th and 10th graders, 40% uh, white, 17% multiracial, 5% um, Middle Eastern, 4% black. Um, it, not be, it ended up not being as racial diverse as we wanted to in terms of, um, in some ways. But we got 11% no response, and this is really important, because the county they were in, they wanted, they're very sensitive to racial issues, and so they wanted us to keep that open, that we, that students, to allow students to not give a response if they did not want to. So 11% of the students did not give a response. And we, we just noticed in front of who was responding, and we noticed that it was mostly white students who didn't give a response. But that gives you some context about kind of the, the county in which we were working at. They, you know, not wanting to talk about race at all. Even having a student write their racial background down, they saw it was kind of sensitive to students. And so this is kind of the context of the, um, of the, the, con the county we were working at. And so we use like and format um, questions that has open-ended questions. And so for our analyses for the quantitative, we did the descriptives, correlation, maneuvers, regressions, and for our qualitative, we did the map analysis. And so we had a variety of motivation variables, um, particularly looking at um, parental variables, um, teacher support variables, um, parent, parent trust, perceived parent-teacher relationship, but we thought that was very important as well. Um, racial ethnic identity, cultural socialization, um, career, science career uh, variable, 
um, and um, the perceived value of a career science uh, variable. So a lot of good motivation um, constructs we're really looking at. But what's really important that I'm going to focus on today was our open-ended question. And so after each section, students were provided with opportunities to respond to open-ended prompts to share what they were feeling and thinking about the topic. So if we gave them uh, a like it uh, scale of uh, scale about you know racial identity and then we ask them so um, is there anything else you would like to us to know anything else you would like us to add so in this case is there anything else you would like us to know about your relationship with your science teacher is there anything else you would like us to know about your cultural identity and so basically upon closer review we found the majority of the students chose not to answer most of them just said you know they skipped it or they just said no not anything i can think of or just kind of general flip and whatever answers that they want to really answer the question you know these are high school students and you don't expect but some of the answers were really interesting. And so I'm going to discuss some of those responses because they became really interesting, particularly um, when you think about terms of race in the science classroom. Okay. He, my science teacher, does not talk about your race, gender, or ethnicity. He takes everyone as equal, and he believes that you have the same opportunities in the field of science as the next person. A kind of white male ninth grade. We talked about biology, not politics and science. Now remember, this is just what else, what else you just want to say. This is whatever you just want to get out of your chest. You know. <laughs> <laughs> the next one. My teacher didn't talk about race or gender because it's not a factor of how well a scientist you are. He, my science teacher, doesn't talk about race because it's not needed. And so all of these students engage in this whole colorblind perspective about race and science, and they hold accepted this whole myth of meritocracy that, you know, we all equal, have equal access to learning science, equal access to science. And then they're all unaware, they're all unaware of the privileges, the many privileges that they actually have within the science classroom. Um, and so it's really interesting. Um, so most of the, 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 the people that we had, I actually showed you are white males, but um, one quote was from a white Native American, white and Native American, whichever is a female, um, but she also didn't see that race or gender matter particularly for scientists. This is really interesting, particularly in terms of women and gender in science. But the next quote I just really want you to, it's a longer quote, but this is the one that really got us to really rethink about our data and the students and everything in our sample. When I read it and you see it, you're going to know why. All the blacks in my science class have been socially and are mentally deficient. They don't deserve to be in this program. I've seen racist, but <coughs> if you tell these people, you will feel the same way. Their presence is required. I understand it's affirmative action and all, but if they subject STEM inductees to IQ tests or something like that, they will see out these imbeciles. Thank you. And then Andrew's white male temporary. Now remember, these are just things that, you know, just anything else you would like to add? You know, this is what he chose to add because he really felt this way. Um, so um, once again, um, Andrew uh, felt very strongly about um, his white privilege in terms of uh, kind of how he felt about um, what was going on in the science classroom. So it's the, this is the epitome of whiteness is property. He asserts white privilege as he determines who does not or does not belong in this in the science classroom. So he is determining who he thinks should or should not have access to the science classroom. Um, and so after reading all the students' comments, and his specifically, we began to look at our quantitative data differently and kind of what it actually was mean. Because, you know, these are the students that are in the classroom, that are in these science classrooms. What messages are they actually sending to all the other students? And so he was actually in one of the more racial diverse STEM academy, the, the, one of the schools that were designed to promote STEM and get more students of color into STEM. And so these are one of the students that's in the actual STEM classroom. So could you imagine if that was your lab partner and that was coming some of the perspectives that they were saying? And what kind of messages is he, he and other students are saying? I mean, there are other, and when you put that in perspective with the other comments, he doesn't talk about races, not he doesn't talk about biology, not science. It makes you really think about what kind of crime is going on in these schools and what are they actually thinking and saying. So I have several implications. Um, but um, for the sake of time, I'm just going to go in a couple of them. Um, so students, mostly white, and some students of color within these STEM-related academic programs had negative views regarding students, students of color. Students of color belong in science and scientific disabilities. So they actually don't see that students of color belong and they actually question their abilities. And the students promoted the belief that science is culturally neutral, inherently white, 
therefore, therefore endorsing white privilege. And so what is it that he knows science is the white thing? You know, the kids of color don't belong. Um, and so these messages communicated to students of color in the various programs that one, race does not matter. Two, talking about the contributions of people of color in science is political, and people of color simply do not belong in science. And so these are very strong messages that they're sending um, to the kids. And so, you know, if we think about all the programs that we do to try to increase the number of people of color in STEM, if these are the people who are in STEM also giving them these messages, you know, you wonder why, you know, it's no wonder why our people, our kids of color particularly aren't interested in, in, in engaging in STEM. Because a lot of times, you know, they want to drop out before they even get to, to college. And these are the people that are in various STEM classes with. And so, um, I just want to leave with this with a basic thoughts that, you know, um, you know, it's most challenging for historically underrepresented populations to develop some scientific identity and feel connected to the science community. And so most efforts to assist people of color to feel connected to the scientific community have focused on increasing the number of people of color in STEM. So though this is a worthy and necessary endeavor, as Peter described, more effort needs to be placed on breaking down the association between science and whiteness. So to the white majority begins to view people of color as potential scientists, any efforts to make change will be futile. So our study helps to demonstrate that until schools and teachers begin to address social and cultural obstacles that underrepresented groups face in feeling connected to the scientific community, our efforts to broaden participation in STEM careers will fail. So as demonstrated, exploring the roles that race and motivation plays in the science classroom is imperative. See you all. Thanks for making the right choice. <laughs> uh, so my name is Jamal, and um, you know, just jumping right into, I guess, my remarks for today. You know, it's really clear as day that we have some really deep racial divides in the U.S. And you know, while these issues have, um, you know, persisted for ages, it's really been over the past several years that they've come into a clearer view for many folks who once believed that we lived in a, a race, a post-racial society. So you know, despite the challenges you know, of recent events um, for the past couple of years, the, the season also represents a, a ripe opportunity for social scientists, particularly social scientists who study education. Uh, we've seen a clear uptick in equity and social justice research and education journals. Um, however, motivation researchers have had little to contribute um, to these conversations. And when you look at some of our habits in motivation research, it's it's pretty clear to uh, see why. So, for example, race-based research represents um, race-based research represents less than two percent of uh, research articles in top ed site journals where you tend to see uh, motivation research displayed. On top of this, uh, we also have to acknowledge our lack of sophistication with how we've handled race and culture methodologically, using race as a control variable, moderator variable, making these um, stark comparisons between poor kids of color and white middle class kids and so on. So when you combine these issues, they have a variety of negative implications, but one of the most notable, in my opinion, is misappropriation. Educators apply our work, apply our findings into classrooms with uh, diverse racial groups. So the real question becomes, um, how do we sort of make motivation and research more critical? And similar to what um, Jessica had mentioned, I believe one of our best avenues in doing this is beginning to adopt some of the principles of critical race theory, um, of which there are many tenets, but I'll just review a, a few here. Number one, just an explicit acknowledgement that institutional racism exists in society and schools, and not only the acknowledgement, but thinking about what this means for our theoretical and conceptual frameworks that um, rarely acknowledge the reality of, of systemic racism in our schools. Second, thinking about this idea of or acknowledging counter narratives um, that challenge some of the dominant discourse in our field that's based primarily on decades of research with white middle class populations. So um, there's a, a great quote that I love by a Nigerian poet and scholar. And he says, um, until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. And I really like that quote when thinking about counter narratives because it conveys this idea that as long as the story continues to be framed from the narratives of those in power, 
then those who are marginalized will infrequently or rarely have an opportunity to have their stories told. And it's that experiential knowledge, those stories that we also have to think about as legitimate and valid empirical knowledge and data. And think about how this challenges some of our esteem methods in motivation research, namely survey research and RCTs. Um, and then also research that is emancipatory, interdisciplinary, and uh, transdisciplinary. Now, I, I realize that these are a lot of elements and difficult for motivation research to engage. However, if we do do work um, that involves marginalized populations, I would encourage us to think about what's at least one of these tenets um, that we can um, honor or as an avenue for our work that we can think about as we move forward. Um, and here we have some examples of, uh, some powerful examples of recent measures um, and motivation, the uh, motivation measures that begin to tap into some of these uh, elements of critical race. And the powerful thing about these scales and theories is that they were developed and validated with children of color in mind versus validated on white middle class populations and then misappropriated to evaluate populations of color, which really happens all too often in motivation and psychological research. Um, but, you know, measures like these, I will admit, are few and far between. So we have to work with what we have and think creatively about our existing constructs um, and find clever opportunities to uh, develop or uh, engage some of these tenets of critical race theory. And one way that I've tried to I'll present a little bit of how I've tried to do some of that in my own work. Um, so a big interest of mine has always been achievement values specifically attainment values, uh, which I study in mathematics classrooms. And we know attainment values is basically the importance that students attach to an academic domain or task as they see it as self-reflective of their own identity. So when students say something like, I'm not a math person, this is you know, inherently an attainment value um, statement that they're making. And we know that values in concert with expectations is a vital ingredient for predicting persistence, effort, you know, goal setting, and mathematics and the like. But in my own attempt to be more critical about achievement values, attainment values, you know, I had to ask the very real question um, to myself, my own work was what do attainment values look like within an educational system that never intended for black, brown, and poor children to belong? So if we think about the history of our country, it's really littered with illustrations of how our educational system never intended for certain people to have access to an equitable education. In fact, was designed to create and maintain inequity. And you know, these images that I have on the screen are really just the tip of the iceberg in that regard. So you know, um, we may look at these images and sort of think that this is a really dark and distal um, past within our country, but um, we remain largely complicit in the ripple effect um, of this history. Uh, even now in 2019, uh, for example, tens of thousands of black and Latinx students attend schools that bear the name of Confederate leaders who dedicated their lives for terrorizing and enslaving non-whites. They're still pervasive underrepresentation of black, brown, and poor children in high rigor schools and academic tracks. Zero tolerance discipline policies disproportionately or, um, target and remove black and Latinx students from the classroom. The list goes on and on and on, again, just the tip of the iceberg here. So with these historical and contemporary issues, we really have to ask ourselves, um, what do achievement values mean under circumstances like these? So considering all of this, um, I decided to conduct uh, semi-structured interviews with about uh, three dozen black and Latinx adolescents across five different schools in Newark, New Jersey. And my goal in this was really to understand students um, achievement value of mathematics in context, which means, you know, how does race, how does stigma, how does social political histories influence, uh, you know, what math means to these adolescents. And I also wanted to honor the voices and experiential knowledge of these adolescents, giving them a chance to tell their own story through their own words. So for these interview data, I used a modified ground theory approach, which I won't go into now just for the sake of time. But through that, um, some main themes emerge, and I want to talk about this last theme here, um, which is most interesting for me, entitled Protecting Our Own and Resisting Stigma. Um, so this theme was most interesting in that it represented a unique intersection of racial identity and achievement value of mathematics. 
So the students um, in this theme represented, oh, just relax, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> represented uh, an exceptional profile in that they were able to bring a critical consciousness to their perceptions of stigma regarding their race in mathematics. Um, they resisted pejorative perceptions of their race and attempted to rewrite these scripts, i.e. counter narratives, um, through their own persistence in math, through their social political understanding of racial stereotypes and with uh, supportive messages from their families. So interestingly, of the three dozen students that I interviewed across five schools, the students that represented this theme all came from the same high school. Um, and unfortunately, this is a high school that, been, that has been ranked among one of the lowest in the state for um, over two decades. It was also a homogeneously black high school. So um, this intersection of having a predominantly black school, uh, but also a historically failing school, like created this intersection or this stigmatized association between um, race and achievement, which really reflected poorly on the black students in this district. So the students in this theme really strive to be exceptional in academics and in mathematics uh, to resist the stigma placed on the school and thus the black community. So I just wanna play a clip from um, a couple of students just to see how they respond to that. It's because this name, like Malcolm X, is like history and stuff. So I just, I just wanna like get good grades so it can make the school look better and make me look and I'm gonna look better. So like, if you just look at the school like before, it probably could have been bad, and like, there's students here that wouldn't learn. But if we keep working and keep getting our grades up, it's gonna make the school look better statistically. So it does mean something to me. As African American children, because like, if the, if the school looks better, then the students will too, because the first thing to look at is the students that's in that attend the school, and then they look at them and be like, oh, well, they had any thoughts. But at the same time, we have a like, good grades, man. So they can't, they can't doubt us about how we look if we get our work done. So I really like that last line. They can't doubt us about how we look if we get our work done. So for this student, he obviously has a resistance mentality, um, but one that is grounded in a collective orientation. So his achievement his work ethic, his persistence is not only for his own self-preservation, but also for garnering respect um, for the black community, the black students at the school. And if you uh, look to the left here, your left, um, you see some of the sub-patterns within this theme. And I just wanna play one more clip uh, from a student, again, at the same school, Shayla, um, uh, as this clip really reinforces uh, how some of these patterns come together to motivate math persistence and a growth mindset. It's because this name, like, Sorry. my... There we go. Everybody isn't always best at every and everything they first, or they try to do it. Like, so you have to, I have to push myself, I have to uh, be able to pick up things, to work with things. They don't understand because if I don't, then I'm just gonna be. That's always gonna be my excuse. Oh, math is not my subject. Like I don't want to have an excuse. I want to be able to. Like, all right, math was, wasn't my subject at some point in time, but I pushed myself. I was able to overcome that. I was able to do better. They would tell me, "Are you looking at them? Yeah, you're black. You can't change that." And there's already enough people that don't think of my culture, like as a good thing, like, some people don't want us here. Some people try to eliminate what we have. So what I realized is you have to work 10 times harder knowing your circumstances. Okay, so for Shayla here, we also see <clears throat> a resistance mentality where she uses math to highlight her exceptionality in order to challenge stereotypes and stigma about her race and culture. So thinking about all this together, the question is, is this still attainment value? I guess we could have a conversation about that for a while, but in my perspective, I would say yes, but a more racialized or uh, resistance-oriented conception of attainment value. So these interviews that I conducted, you know, got me really excited, um, you know, about this work, and given uh, what was discussed in the interviews, you know, I wanted to look at the various intersections of how youth negotiate their um, 
racial identity uh, along with their mathematics identity, particularly when they're aware of stereotypes and stigma about their race. So to get at this idea, I ran a latent profile analysis with uh, roughly 240 uh, black American adolescents, again in New Jersey. My intersecting variables were um, uh, math attainment value, which we know, racial centrality, which comes from the seller's camp, which is a measure of how poor one's racial identity is to a sense of self, and then racial public regard, which is a measure of individuals' perception of how broader society evaluates their race. So basically we have a measure of math identity, a measure of racial identity, and a measure of perceived social stigma around one's uh, race. So um, from this profile analysis, uh, five profiles came out of the intersection. I did all my fit and enumeration checks to make sure that five was the optimal number of profiles. Uh, these were the five profiles that broke out. Um, you can see the description, uh, the title that describes the intersection um, at the bottom. At the bottom. Um, all these profiles were really interesting in their own right, but uh, a couple that I just want to highlight in particular. Um, so what I have here is the math attained and math disdained profile. So these are the students, um, you know, I am a math person, I'm definitely not a math person. And I would argue that these really represent the dominant narrative of what we know, you know, over the recent decades on um, the attainment value literature, again, based on white middle class samples. So we would expect this highly attained profile um, to be high on a variety of math efficacy outcomes and other persistent outcomes as well, and then the opposite for the disdain profile. But what I really want to highlight here is this last profile, um, this racially and mathematically resilient profile. Uh, and we see that this profile is really interesting because for these students, despite them perceiving that uh, society generally views black Americans negatively as indicated by the negative gray bar, they have a racial identity, a math identity that exceeds the mean. Um, a standard deviation, a half standard deviation to over a standard deviation. Um, so, you know, this is really resonant with what came out of the, the qualitative interviews that I was doing, this idea of protecting our own resisting stigma, this idea of resilience despite uh, perceived stigma. So I would argue here that this, program, uh, this profile, again, is a, is a counter narrative um, to what we would expect compared to your sort of typical attained versus disdained uh, profiles. So with this, the next step for me uh, was to look at the profile transitions over time. In my data, I had four different time points. Here I had the last two time points, three and four. Um, the columns, uh, the rows, I'm sorry, um, represent spring 2017. The columns represent spring 2018. Um, and students transition to different profiles. I found the same five profiles over time, but students transition to different profiles um, from one year to the next. If we look at the diagonal here, this is the percentage of students who remained in their profile from spring uh, 2017 to uh, spring 2018. And we see that it's the majority of students for the majority of profiles. So these are the stayers, the, the students who stayed. But if we look at the columns, um, these are the movers. Uh, these are students who transferred into a different profile from their first time point. And from this comes a whole bunch of really interesting questions. So if we look at the math staying profile, we see that 10 per most of those students stayed from time three to four in that profile, but 10% of those students actually moved to the resilient profile, which really begs the question, what happened between 2017 and 2018 to foster that movement? So um, I followed up on that as well, uh, looking at predictors of the transition. And this came out a little weird, so I'm sorry about that. But <laughs> okay. uh, so I used the measure of school racial climate by uh, Kristen Bird um, at North Carolina State uh, to look at classroom level predictors of these transitions. Um, and the students here would rate whether their math teacher took a colorblind, colorblind approach to their instruction or was um, stereotyping through their instruction or had a culturally relevant or critical consciousness in their mathematics instruction. And then finally, I allowed um, the profiles to predict um, a bunch of different outcomes as well. So uh, talking through this would take another 20 minutes, which I don't have at 20 seconds. Um, <laughs> so I'm just going to skip through um, some of this other part that I have, but want to just 
again, um, make the point that this is a way, you know, that I've tried to adopt some of the elements of uh, critical race theory um, in my own work. And it doesn't have to be an all or nothing thing, but thinking about which pieces of this can be honored or can I honor in my own work. And what I just presented, really thinking critically about counter narratives and spiritual. Maternal, maternal side. Um, my grandmother, my mother's mother's family, and this is the Rollator family in Buckhead, Georgia, which is a suburb of Atlanta, uh, around 1934. And here's a picture with me in it, uh, linking me to this photo of the Rollator cabin that was reconstructed inside the Atlanta History Center in 1999. And that's my grandmother. Um, I'm sitting with, she's in the, the wheelchair, and that's her picture you know, as a little girl in the, in the photo. It's a pretty white picture though. I mean, look at all these white people. And um, these are my roots. Atlanta is part of it, and some swamp in South Carolina is the other part. Um, but the deep south are my roots. And Jessica, as you were talking about Georgia, I was like, oh my gosh, these are my people, you know? I mean, yeah. Um, and I could, I could tell you more about that history, but I think it just was important visually to begin with sort of, this is my one part of my family and it's a pretty white family and it's shaped all of the way that I approach motivation research and research in general. So I've experienced a world and um, white people have too. I think that's safe to say, I'll go out on a limb, um, in which whiteness is the norm, the default, um, it's considered best, it's unquestioned, it's the beginning, it's the end. And I'll read you something from Robin D'Angelo, who uh, wrote a book called White Fragility. And um, Robin D'Angelo spoke at the University of Kentucky where I work uh, last week. So it was great to have her there. And I just read the, her book, and I highly recommend it to white people. In virtually every situation or context deemed normal, neutral, or prestigious in society, I belong racially. This belonging is a deep and ever-present feeling that has always been with me. Belonging has settled deep into my consciousness. It shapes my daily thoughts and concerns, what I reach for in life, and what I expect to find. The experience of belonging is so natural that I do not have to think about it. The rare moments in which I don't belong racially come as a surprise, a surprise that I can either enjoy for its novelty or easily avoid if I find it unsettling. As I move throughout my day, racism just isn't my problem. While I'm aware that race has been used unfairly against people of color, I haven't been taught to see this problem as any responsibility of mine, as long as I don't personally do anything that I'm aware of. Racism is a non-issue. This freedom from responsibility gives me a level of racial relaxation, an emotional, intelligent, intellectual space um, that people of color are not afforded as they move throughout their day. Raised in a culture of white supremacy, I exude a deeply internalized assumption of racial superiority. This is our position as white people. It's my position too. Even at AERA, as we consider which sessions we'll go to, which groups are valued, whose ideas we should um, spend our time listening to, racial superiority is at work, and most at work among us white progressive people who hide behind words like race and culture and social justice. This is a problem because of habits, and Jamal talked about habits, and I'm so glad you did, and raised these points that you did. Two quotes that come to mind about habits. One's from William James, the white man that I can't stop quoting. <laughs> um, Just as a sheet of paper or a coat once creased or folded tends to fall forever afterward into the same identical folds. And I'll just take him straight into Henry David Thoreau. A single footstep will not make a path on the earth, so a single thought will not make a pathway in the mind. Um, and he goes on to say, you know, if we wish a thought to dominate our lives, we have to think it over and over again, you know. But here we see two metaphors for habit and the way habits work. So basically the thoughts that we have in our field leave us, lead us to have a certain set of beliefs. 
those beliefs become more rigid rules, and those rules then guide our actions. So again, this sort of came out of a Jamesian notion and others uh, that beliefs are rules for action. This is my theoretical framework. And if that's true, then we've got to examine our own beliefs as a field um, and the habits that, the, that those beliefs form. And after all, habits lead us to a character. And so I might ask us to think about what has characterized the research on academic motivation. Because it comes out of all this stuff, our thoughts, our beliefs, our actions, the ways we have of thinking and explaining, and then this characterizes our field, right? Thanks. So here, here are a few of the people who've um, influenced me in my thinking. Um, some of the forefathers of motivation theory, and the mother, a mother. <laughs> no offense to anyone in the room who should also be up here. But this is a pretty wide field, huh? And um, these are the folks that I've had my students read on syllabi for years and years. This is kind of the frame that has characterized academic motivation for me. However, I always come back to this uh, passage from Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of Freedom. No one can be in the world with the world and with others and maintain a posture of neutrality. I cannot be in the world decontextualized, simply observing life. I really wish I could, though. And I, and I do undertake my work as if I'm doing that. Like, I'm really observing the, the, the T truth, but maybe capital T truth. I think we're all on a search for that. But I'm here to say, if you're white, you're blind, and you've got to recognize the blindness um, we've all been socialized to have and to protect. So this leads me to the question, you know, how then do I disrupt this tendency to conduct even my research from the perspective of white supremacy? And I think um, what happened to me that shook me out of something of a slumber was uh, this exercise one of my professors gave me, which I call the skin color lineup. First day of class in graduate school on a class on multicultural education. And the professor sitting behind a table says, all right, Y'all line up at the back of the room by skin color. You've got to be kidding. <laughs> She's like, go on. Here it is. She took our picture. It's grainy because I think it was on one of those floppy disk cameras. <laughs> <laughs> That's us. Every person in this photo now has a PhD, and many of them are here at AERA. Uh, but this was like my second year of grad school. Why'd she do that to us? I think she was trying to point out that, um, well, she was trying to point out a lot of things. One, just to wake us up about where skin color positions you in a power of white, in a, in a culture of white supremacy. But I, I would ask you, what happens if uh, this is what the motivation research field looks like? These are the people doing the research. Or what happens if these are the people on whom we're doing the research and forming our theories? And then what does it look like if these are the people doing the research? Yeah, they might be looking at things and looking for things and observing things quite a little differently. And their samples, if this were a sample, we might be telling a different story. And now what happens if these people are the researchers? What are we gonna hear from them? And if the answer is different, why is it different? As I just went across that, that picture. We each bring frames, and those frames influence what we see. So we were also tasked to share a little bit of current research. So I'll just briefly tell you about a current project I have going. Um, this is not complete. This is a work in progress. It's uh, focused on the first year college experience. And I wanted to share how I've changed the nature of a question that I might have asked at another time in a race blind sort of way. A question like, what's the relationship between students' sense of belonging and how well they perform in college and whether they return the next year? This is sort of the unchecked question. A more nuanced question, to what extent do first year students of color perceive being treated badly because of their race ethnicity? And then how does that treatment in turn affect their sense of belonging and their academic performance? This is a more nuanced question. It focuses on students of color. It recognizes that this is a context, the, the predominantly white institution in which these students have been historically oppressed and it avoids what Jamal was referring to as reductionistic comparisons by group, or just the simple, we included race as a moderator, which I've done, totally have done, yeah. 
Um, yeah, maybe, maybe a lot of us have. And then expanding even further, we might ask, are these relationships mediated by ethnic centrality or salience or an identity variable like Jamal just mentioned? This would consider the role of identity and cultural relevance or in-group affiliation to the motives of the student. So we did this with about uh, 2,500 undergrads in their first year at uh, a university and asked them about their perceptions of ethnic bias, their sense of belonging, and how central um, their ethnic identity was to them. This is work in progress. So I'll just show you what they told us. So since you've started at this university, uh, do you feel you've ever tra been treated badly because of your race? So I'll give you this broken down by non-underrepresented minority students. This is how our university classifies it. These would be white and Asian students and underrepresented minority students. One student wrote, we gave them a chance to just write in uh, uh, any explanation they wanted to. Um, lots of people here seem to be afraid of other ethnicities. It's a shame. It gets more interesting when you look at this by subgroup. Um, so again, since you've started here, have you been treat, ever been treated badly because of your race? At this university, 56% of black students in the first year of college said at least sometime at least once. One wrote, I feel like an outcast here. I do not feel welcome as an African-American student here. It's not as diverse as the university states. So clearly to overlook this, which we could do, we could just say, we did a study on belonging, self-efficacy, fill in the blank with your favorite motivation construct, and just have ignored that completely. But that's to ignore part of a very important part of that student's experience. So to do this a little more sensitive, Sensitively, we conducted a mediation analysis looking at how perception of ethnic bias influences sense of belonging and how that in turn influences an academic outcome like retention. And when we look at this model for students of color, we see that if you've experienced ethnic bias, not surprisingly, you have a lower sense of belonging, a lower sense of belonging, um, or a, sorry, a good a sense of belonging leads you to be more likely to be retained, so odds ratio. Um, and if we look at the direct path from perception of ethnic bias, if you've experienced bias, you're more likely to leave. But when we test this in a, in a mediation path, we find it to be a, a fully mediated model through sense of belonging. So increasing sense, sense of belonging is a good buffer for keeping students at the university even when they've experienced ethnic bias. But that third most nuanced question considers identity. And what we found was that there's a, um, Moderated, the mediation is moderated by ethnic identity centrality, such that the stronger your ethnic identity, this is exactly what Jamal just presented as well, the stronger your sense of ethnic identity, this would be the uh, racially resilient students in your sample, um, this buffers the adverse effects from having um, experienced bias on campus. William James, back to him, see? See what I mean? My students really, they are, get tired of this. <laughs> um, this quote's on my office door. Um, will you or won't you have it so? This is such an important question for us. Sort of like, are you here because you want it to be so that we do a better job accounting for race and the research we do? I mean, will you or won't you have that? He said, it's the most probing question we're ever asked. We're asked it every hour of the day and about the largest as well as the smallest the most theoretical as well as the most practical things. The most probing question. What's keeping you from having it happen? Having it so. What's keeping us from having it so? I think the question for us as a field, and particularly for us white folk in the field, um, will we do these things? Will we offer a more equitable accounting of motivation research? Will we expand our inclusion of culture and race? sat on a national grant panel where the white people in the room were proposal after proposal ignoring race and culture. And the few people of color in the room were trying to point it out and the white people were digging in their heels in resistance. White people that I would never have thought would do that. It was a fascinating dynamic. The people at power, the people in power at the table we're not hearing the message. We're resisting this. This is why that book, White Fragility, is really good. <laughs> uh, 
Um, will we challenge whiteness and motivation research? Will we prioritize the voices of those who are less frequently heard? And this, is, this has to do with who we accept in journals, who we accept uh, at conferences. Um, how about rewarding work in this area? Will we diversify our own research teams? And that includes finding graduate students, undergraduate students, who don't share our perspectives, who are harder maybe for white people to mentor because we fear we're gonna screw that up. But you need to hear the other perspectives. We need different voices at the table. Um, will we work with other units who are doing a better job of this? And I think some of them are here at ADRA, probably in rooms where I hustle. Back to James, you know, he said that, and I think this was quoting someone else, the rivalry of patterns is the history of the world. The rivalry of our habits, our habitual ways of thinking, will be the history of our field. Whether we uh, challenge the, the ways of thinking that have always been so, or we don't, that will be our legacy, our history that we leave behind. So, I leave you with that to think about. Thank you. Again, thanks to Erica for organizing this event. I actually feel like I'm the odd man out because I'm the only uh, person not based in a U.S. institution in this uh, in this panel. So I was actually grateful and surprised at the same time that Erica invited me for this uh, interesting panel. So the title of my talk will be about this sense of uh, cultural imagination in motivation scholarship. So let me get into this by talking a little bit like. Uh, Jessica did and uh, Ellen did about their family background. So I'm actually a third generation uh, Chinese Filipino living in the, I grew up in the Philippines. My dad's ethnically Chinese and my mom's Filipino. Now for those of you who watch Crazy Rich Asians, there was some <laughs> Crazy Rich Asian drama going on when my dad married my mom. So <laughs> even at birth, we already had a very interesting uh, dynamic with the Chinese family on my dad's side and the Filipino family on my and I've never worked in the US or in North America. I've always worked in Asia. Most of my work has been done in Hong Kong as well as uh, Singapore. Now these two societies, as well as the Philippines where I grew up in, it's very interesting because we have one of the highest levels of societal inequality in the world. And I tell you that because I'll have some interesting uh, thoughts about that much later in the talk. Now I'm starting my uh, journey towards culture and motivation when I was a PhD student because basically I was interested in looking at traditional motivational constructs. My favorite, at that time, my favorite construct was goal theory or achievement goal theory. So I wanted to see how achievement goals would play out in the motivation of Hong Kong students as well as Filipino students. Now, for an Asian student like myself, all the literature we read are mostly from uh, American uh, studies. So when I was looking at this literature, a lot of the times my classmates and I were thinking about this doesn't really describe our motivation so well, but there's nothing in the literature to support our ideas. So we had to go along. And, um, <laughs> but there were many, many puzzling findings that we couldn't really explain. Like these are just some of the findings that I found. Like for example, and I always get reviewers commenting on this, they said you don't have your your studies lack construct validity because mastery and performance goals or intrinsic and extrinsic motivation are always very much strongly correlated in Asian contexts. But that's not the case, I think, in the West. We also found that avoidance goals are not maladaptive and social motivation was a very powerful facilitator of engagement and motivation. Now, I felt that I was really alone because the reviewers were always like, leading down, that's not Right, etc. So we had difficulty publishing studies that did not conform, unfortunately, to the Western literature. Then I realized I was actually not alone. There are many scholars who actually did find some interesting cross-cultural uh, findings as well. Now this one study, I think, uh, this was actually a study conducted in a Chinese setting by colleagues in Hong Kong. And what they found was that students 
or Chinese students who were interested in pleasing their parents and their teachers were actually very motivated in engaging school. Now that's very different from what you would find for Western students, for whom seeking for social approval would be considered like extrinsic, external, and something that would actually lead to self-handicapping tendencies. Now this study, I think most of you would be familiar with this uh, Iyengar and Leffer study were showing how personal choice was actually more important for Western students or Anglo-American students compared to, for example, Asian students who are actually more motivated when significant others made the choice for them rather than it being a personal choice. Now I think in Andy Eliot's team also about this interesting uh, cross-cultural difference where they found that avoidance goals, which I think is a, I think in most of the literature is considered a relatively maladaptive type of goal. But what they found was that this was only a negative predictor of well-being in Western individualistic cultures, but not so much in collectivist cultures. So I think when we were struggling, and I was struggling with these findings together with my supervisor, so we were coming from more from the perspective of cross-cultural psychology. We were struggling with how to reconcile these findings that we couldn't really explain in terms of the Western literature. And luckily I found these, all these group of people, Martin Maher, Sandra Graham, and Cortes, who were talking about the bias. And that bias in educational psychology research is about ignoring culture. And I think uh, Martin Maher had this uh, beautiful quote about culture being a critical ingredient of society and a very important concept that can help us understand the nature and action of human beings. This was actually um, recorded in an interview that Rebecca gave. And Sandra Graham, I think, just two years ago in a very interesting uh, panel discussion was challenging these uh, white guys, and I think Ellen showed their pictures a while ago, about how can you assure that your theory, the young scholars in this audience, your theory has generalizability and relevance to many other peoples other than white people. So I think in educational psychology, we're starting to become aware of these, the importance of not ignoring culture, which we have ignored so long. So I think that led to uh, my thinking on that topic led to two publications, one in educational psychologies where I was actually arguing for the important role of uh, culture in helping us understand um, similarities and differences in motivational patterns as well as in another uh, paper was I was trying to argue for this need for a cultural imagination in motivation scholarship. What do I mean by imagination? I think um, I didn't really come up with a theory, but it's more like a, a way of thinking that I think could help me and help other researchers as well grapple with these issues of motivation, culture, or race and ethnicity. So I, I would think of cultural imagination not as a specific theory or framework, but rather as an outlook or a way of seeing things or human beha behavior that's very sensitive to the power of social culture forces. And when I was thinking about that, I was actually thinking, so how do I actually conduct culturally imaginative research? So if I'm saying that we need to be more culturally imaginative, how do I actually do that? Now I got, I got some leads from cross-cultural psychologists. The first thing that they were suggesting that was that we need to be very aware and alert of not just mean level differences, which I think is the usual mode of business in educational cycle. We compare Western versus um, Eastern or Chinese or Japanese uh, needs. But I think we, need, we also need to be more sensitive that the relationships among these key constructs are also very different from me. It's just not the mean levels, but the nomological networks itself might actually be different across cultural contexts. The second is helping us unpack the sources of cross-cultural variability. We need to be, in my own thinking, I was trying to be more aware of these critical cultural ingredients. We say there are cultural differences and similarities. What would these cross-cultural cultural ingredients would be that could actually account 
for the similarities and differences. And I think it's also very important to complement ethic with emic approaches that are more faithful to indigenous perspectives. And of course, maybe we also need to broaden the forms of culture exam. Because for a lot of the times, when we think of culture, we think of it as a national culture. So the US, Canada, Chinese, Japanese, right? But culture is not just ethnic differences or not just national differences. Religion can be a form of culture. Differences in region can be a form of culture. So for example, Ellen was talking about the deep south in the US, they would probably have a very different culture from those in the West Coast. And even in China, northern China, Southern China have very different uh, cultures, though we think of them hegemonically as Chinese. Social class differences, which I have gotten very interested in, how do these forms of culture affect our favorite motivational constructs? Now, one of the ways that I tried to do this was to look at, again, my favorite uh, theory, goal theory in uh, so what I tried to do was to look at the different types of achievement goals across cultures and how they can actually lead to different motivational outcomes. So I think the traditional way uh, people would go about this research is just to try to control for your nationality or culture. But what I tried to do was to actually examine which types of goals are most salient for different for peoples from different cultural traditions. So I look at a range of goals in terms of mastery, performance, social, and extrinsic, and extrinsic goals. And we did a, now this is actually a, a very interesting analysis. We, we, we call it the causal, causal dominance analysis, which tries to partition out the variance accounted for by different types of goals. So what we found was, the interesting finding we found was that, for example, among the Anglo group, the Anglo-Australian group, a lot of the variance in engagement was actually predicted by their mastery goals. I think that's something that we would expect from the Western literature, that mastery goals is the most optimal form of goals. It leads to uh, better engagement. But what we found was that for Asian students, like those in Hong Kong, Singapore, and Philippines, actually social goals were more important. Goals related to pleasing your parents, goals related to affiliating with your peers, they were actually more important in predicting engagement compared to traditionally the traditionally researched constructs of mastery or even performance goals. So I think that got us into thinking that maybe we need to be more sensitive to these structure-oriented differences. Maybe the constructs relate to the nomological networks might actually be different for peoples from different cultures. And I think um, I was lucky to be invited uh, for another, for this special issue on race reimaging and educational psychology in CEP up, coming up, coming out in CEP. And again, we were actually looking at how powerful the family is in terms of optimizing motivation and engagement. I think I'll skip that a bit and talk about my um, the things that I'm more interested in right now. Just, uh, <laughs> now this is actually, now I was, um, this is, I was lucky because Akani uh, gave us a copy of her uh, questions. So I had time like a, the crazy Asian that I was in crack. <laughs> I need to have answers to all these things. <laughs> so Akani was asking about, I think later oh, I should ask that. <laughs> she would ask about Equity. <laughs> okay. Issues of equity. Now, when, as a cross-cultural psychologist, I think equity is not something that we traditionally focus on as well. But remember I told you about the Philippines, Hong Kong, and Singapore having very high levels of income inequality. So I think that's one of the things that I was actually looking at. Because culture or this ecology, we all survive in this ecology and income inequality, I think, is a very sensitive issue. It's rising all over the world, in the US, as well as in other parts of the other parts of the world. So this is what has been very interesting. I have been collaborating with some uh, developmental and health psychologists. 
is looking at levels of income inequality and how they affect the outcomes. Now this is, I think, something that we motivation scholars or educational psychologists have not really looked at. That cross-national differences in income inequality could actually have an effect on very important learning outcomes. Now this is just a picture showing the darker, in the darker colors would have higher levels of um, income inequality. So I think China, the Philippines, they have very high levels of income inequality. And increasingly, European countries and Western countries are also having increasingly higher levels of income inequality. So my collaborators, who are actually not educational psychologists, they have taught me something about this, uh, about this topic, looking at how different levels of income inequality are actually affecting health outcomes or well-being outcomes. So we published these uh, two papers looking at the harmful effects of income inequality. Um, the first one is about um, <coughs> and the second one is on adolescence in China. So I think that's the future work that I want to do. What I want to do is to examine how issues of income inequality, something that we motivation scholars have not really talked about and social economic development, how can they actually impact motivation and learning? And I think I will have a little Monday for our symposium on, uh, on Monday, which will actually be talking about that issue. How culture and context, and I think income inequality is part of that uh, context that we are all in, but maybe we're not so aware of and how they can actually impact motivation and learning processes. So this is actually what we found. So. Um, income inequality. Now, we, for, for studies like these, we've used the Program for International Student Assessment, which is a uh, worldwide database of student achievement from, I think, more than 73 countries and 500,000 students. So I think for, for studies that actually look at income inequality, we need to have enough countries to analyze and countries with different levels of uh, income inequality. So one of our key findings was that um, income inequality is very harmful for student achievement. And income inequality is not just harmful for student achievement, it also deters student motivation, as well as actually reducing the benefits associated with motivation. So we, th we tend to look at motivation just as an individual thing, but what we're showing is that the dividends or the yields that you have from your motivation actually differs as a function of income and inequality or where you're situated. So I think those are some of the ways that I have been trying to be more culturally imaginative as well as more attentive to issues of uh, equity in my own uh, research. And I think I'd like to end with this quote from uh, David Foster Wallace. It is two, the story of these two young fish swimming along. And they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way, who nods at them and says, morning boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit, and then eventually one of them looks over at the other and goes, what the hell is water? So I think, I hope we're not like that uh, fish, that we don't know the context where we're swimming. Thank you very much. My name is Akani Zusho, um, and, and I first want to actually thank the uh, leadership team of SIG Motivation for, for really organizing and featuring this event. Um, I, I don't know actually who came up with the title of the session, but I have to say it, it really captures um, my feeling that I've had um, over, you know, I've been attending AERA for, I think, I hate to admit this, but probably close to 20 years now, and um, I really feel like it's only been the last couple of years that we've you know, seriously start to have these conversations. And so I'm really grateful um, that we are starting to really give serious consideration to these issues because uh, we really need to, I think. Um, so in terms of my goals today, I, um, I was charged to lead an interactive discussion. So I do hope the panelists will chime in that as uh, Ronald said they have my, they had already got my questions, but I also hope, you know, to, uh, I, well, would like to invite the audience to also chime in um, if they feel. Uh, but um, I really want 
uh, I mean, uh, can we first give a round of applause for that one? really interesting and unique insights into this topic and, and I personally want to know a little bit more about their approaches so I'm hoping by asking these questions that we could gain more insight into them. Um, I've been doing this work for a while and I've, um, you know, I've, I've noticed there are some themes and tensions in the work that we do and, it's, and it's, so one of the goals that I hope to um, meet <laughs> um, is to sort of make those, those tensions explicit and talk a little bit more deeply about them. Um, ultimately, I hope, I'm hoping that we can have a, you know, talk more about you know um, the future of motivation research as it relates to this topic. You know, in grad school, uh, I don't know about you guys, but one of the things that I was uh, that got drilled into me <laughs> is the importance of defining terms. Um, and uh, these three terms, I think, um, doesn't really show up that well, but um, often are used uh, in, in this work that we do. Um, culture, ethnicity, race. I think we heard those three words uh, in the various presentations today. And I don't often think that we define them clearly. In fact, sometimes we use them interchangeably. Race, ethnicity often gets lumped together by that. You know? um, so uh, I, one of my first questions to the panelists, and also again, uh, invite audience members to join in, is you know, how are we defining these terms? Um, and uh, you know, some of the, the presentations, I think, were more uh, aligned with race, and I would love to hear more about that. Others were more aligned with culture. I would, I would say my work kind of, uh, right now is kind of straddling the two, but I think it leans a little bit more towards the culture ethnicity side myself. But, um, but so yeah, I, I, I don't know how to, should we <laughs> go, how would you guys want to do this? Do you want to just speak if you feel so moved? Yeah, I, I just hate like you know picking on people. I don't know, it's my motivation side. But, um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so let's just start there. How do you, how would you guys define these terms? And if there's any um, you know uh, um, particular term that you resonate more to, or you want to talk more about, feel free. Okay, I'm just gonna say I I don't have a necessarily gonna like use a, a definition, but I study race. Um, mostly because I study African Americans and African Americans are richly defined. Um, so I look at, um, you know, so I study race. Um, so I use critical race theory, and most all the theories I use are race based. Um, so I, I have no qualms about focusing on race, talking about race, calling out race. I do race. Um, so that's what I do. I don't talk about ethnicity, you know, but that's like, you know, particularly because African, you know, African Americans are richly defined. I talk about, you know, I talk about black people. Black people from Puerto Rico, black people from the Dominican Republic. So it's about black people. So I talk about race. So for me, race is always at the forefront. Everything else follows race. And for me, race trumps everything else. Um, so even if we talk about intersectionality, it's race and whatever. So it's always race is always going to be at the center of focus for me. Everything else, whether it's social class, whatever, gender, race is first, and then whatever else. So for me, it's always. I think uh, for my work, I would actually focus on culture more, partly because of my context as well. In, in Hong Kong and the Philippines, and um, it's a very ethnically homogeneous society. So I think in Hong Kong, we have 95% of Chinese, and in the Philippines, it's maybe 95% or 99% Filipino. So I think, uh, plus coming as an outsider to this, um, to this motivation scholarship, I think I'd be more sensitive to issues of uh, culture which I define as shared meaning systems. So I would define culture just, not just national culture, which would maybe overlap with ethnicity, but it's a shared meaning system. So that's why I would think region, social class, and religion are also forms of, forms of culture. But they do definitely intersect with, with race and ethnicity. It's tricky, isn't it? Because uh, when I look at that picture, I, for a minute I was like, oh yeah, you've got it right up there. And then I started thinking, you know what? Um, it's problematic to treat race monolithically and to ignore subcultures within race, racial groups. So, then I was like, oh crap. Well, then, then we'd have to sort of turn that picture around. Yeah. yeah um, because yeah. you can have different shared meaning systems within a race group. Um, so, that I'm not sure there's only one. I, I kind of like your, 
oh, maybe you don't have that. Maybe I imagined it, but that we didn't have to choose just one depiction of how these three things oh, intersect. Oh, yeah, no, yeah, I, uh, yeah, but. I also wanted to comment on what Jessica said about the race being central. We have a social justice scholarship series in my department, and um, each spring we take a different theme, and we started with race, and then the next year someone said, how about social class? This is like white code for let's stop talking about race. <laughs> Um, and so our department chair, our current department chair, uh, Kevin Tyler said, okay, we'll do social class, but with race. <laughs> and I was like, oh, the white people really didn't want to go there. And so I think there's resistance to talking about race if you're white. It's part of the white fragility thing I spoke about. Um, so I, I just wanted to say that because I think often in, America, in the American context, uh, white folks want to talk about anything, any other social grouping, but race, and tend to stay away from it. I don't know if that's your experience, but a lot of experience. Uh, yeah, so I was really interested in, quite, I'm interested in seeing, um, I guess, everyone's definitions, or hearing everyone's definitions with the questions. I think mine might be a little different. When I think about these spheres, you know, if we were to take, uh, I guess, the or circles, um, you know, the race circle and the culture circle, if you were sort of overlap them like a Venn diagram. For me, ethnicity would be that part in the middle. Um, and, you know, sometimes even my, you know, use of race when I talk about race is, um, I don't want to say inaccurate, but lazy in a sense, you know, when I'm really thinking about ethnicity. And ethnicity is something that um, I look at a lot in my work and I think about a lot in my work and as Jessica and, um, you know, Ellen said, uh, there's a lot of different um, shared values within racial groups. So I think a lot about, you know, African Americans versus Black Caribbeans versus African immigrants in the States. And there are a lot of tensions between these groups that oftentimes goes unrealized and, you know, um, unspoken about within, within research. Um, so, yeah. I'm from, yeah, I'm coming from, New, I grew up in New York, yeah. right, so you have a lot of different black cultures yes. in New York, so I think these yeah. regional differences also play yeah. into that. South is very I just wanted to make sure that there's, there's a bunch of questions here, so I was just curious in terms of how much time we had. Well, yeah. if I may comment yeah. from the audience perspective, um, I think maybe the issue you're trying to raise, or at least I'll try to raise it, is this, this is complicated to find. The color of my skin is brown, but if I'm the second generation, I have, I could potentially orient towards different values than if I'm a first generation immigrant. And so I think we also need to be careful about, we don't want to box everything, but at the same time we want to study them. So I think we need to think about how complex this really is. And I think that's potentially what Jamal was also talking about. Some of them are overlapping. I don't know if there's a clear definition, but I appreciate the fact that you're bringing awareness to the fact that we need to start identifying the language that we're using. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, uh, I mean I, I'm just as guilty as being lazy in my use of terms. Um, uh, you know, and, and I do think that part of the difficulty or the challenge is that there is so much overlap. So, you know, I have this question about how important is it to achieve definitional clarity when it comes to these terms. Well, on the one hand, yes, it would be nice if we kind of had more of a shared understanding of, of the terms when we use them. But on the other hand, I, uh, you know, recognize that it's not, that it's, these terms in particular are very, very difficult to define and operationalize in a consistent way. Yeah. I would just like to add that You know, so we go back, so we start discriminating just based upon ethnicity. I mean, so yeah, it, it, there's no biological uh, difference, but there definitely are sociological differences. Totally, but the, then 
then that is the that is the interesting variable, right? Like let's let's just not use the, the term race, but let's talk about social belonging or social economic status or well, but we'll find some other term to discriminate against. So basically we can just fill in the blank. Whatever word we want to use, we'll fair find some other way to discriminate. We still gonna say, Oh, I'm darker, so then we make it the skin color, you might say, Oh, my hair's curlier. Or it's gonna be something that we're gonna group people and create these differences. So you know, whether or not we don't want to use the word the term race, it's going to be something that we're going to box group the group people in, and we're going to discriminate against them. And so I don't have an issue with using the word race because we know race makes people uncomfortable. If we start having a conversation about race, like really start having a conversation about race, there's going to be some serious emotions in this room, and there's going to be some negative emotions going on in this room because it makes people uncomfortable. Now, black people, we talk about race all the time. We don't get worked up about it because we are a press, a press group. But um, a lot of white people get upset about it because it makes them uncomfortable. And so the idea about let's get rid of the term, um, it's, a, it's a real term. Even though it's not real in terms of uh, biology, we have made it real over time, how we look at people, how we treat people. And so I'm not in support of getting rid of it because all we're gonna do is create something, use something else in its place. And so I don't see what getting rid of it would actually do. But that's just my personal opinion. I think Robin D'Angelo would say um, that is a form of white fragility. So uh, I, I don't think she would. She says that. Um, <laughs> that white people of wanting to abandon, let's stop using race terms, because to use race terms is to promote racism, is one way that white people get out of the conversation about their own uh, complicity in a racist, uh, a white supremacy, a white supremacist society. And it's, she offers compelling evidence. I, I wish I was thinking, do I have her book here in an e-form? I don't, I don't think I do, otherwise I'd go to that page and read you some of it. She's but in some shorter work as well, yeah, that's very good about, about how we, um, we, we really would like to feel more comfortable. <laughs> and abandoning race words maybe gives us the illusion of that, but it would not dismantle white supremacy. So uh, I moved to this slide, and we're gonna come back to equity because I, I think that's another term that we really need to focus on and define more clearly. Um, but in, in conducting this research, I'm always, um, and, I, and I've written about this too, um, there is a tension between, and I think some of the comments that we've had so far kind of alludes to this tension, uh, between cultural universalism. So, you know, we're essentially the same in many ways, you know, at our core, there's more like, uh, uh, more things that are, are alike or you know, unifying things than than are than there are differences. Um, and on the other end, you know, but 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 you know, but race <laughs> is and history and slavery and you know all these at least what, as it um, pertains to American um, history, um, uh, you know, these things matter, right? And so I you hear a lot of times that we do need to. To talk more about that, and culture matters, right? Um, uh, um, and so that's more of the cultural relevance side. Um, I, I, my gut is that we need a balance of the two, and um, and I also worry about the extremes of, of both ends. Uh, you know, I think some of the colorblind comments that um, we've heard about today uh, is, you know, cultural universalism taken to the extreme. Um, I also worry currently uh, about some of the nationalist tendencies, which I think. Um, so um, I just kind of wanted to, to you know, call attention again to this, this uh, tension I see and uh, if any of the panelists want to talk about that and where they see current motivation research, you know, where, where, is, where does it align, where does their work align, um, you know, do they see these things as a tension or, you know, complementary, um, I don't know, open up to you guys. <laughs> I will speak on behalf of Paul Schutz, who's not here, because he's at tea time. <laughs> <laughs> but I asked him this question today and showed him Oh, this. you did? What did he say? Yeah, I'll, I'll just <laughs> say what he said. So I don't think he would mind. So Paul said, I think the self-determination theory needs are the only things hanging out at the we're essentially the same side. Everything else is on the culturally relative side. That was sort of his rough approximation in terms of motivation theory. And so I'm thinking about that. 
I don't, I don't know, I don't know if I agree. I'd have to give this a little more thought. Um, but I think he was leaning more toward, you know, that motives take on meaning in context. And that is different than a, a cultural universalism approach. Um, on the other hand, I'll reinvoke Bernie Weiner from a couple of years ago, who said, when asked by Sondra Graham if attribution theory was a <coughs> culturally universal theory, he said, I'm a main effects guy. I'm not interested in interactions. Mm. Their cup is kind of like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I guess theoretically he sees attributions as being a cultural universal. And I think what's important, what Paul added was, I think the questions, what we need in our field is to go back to philosophy of science. Um, how do we determine, are there, you know, capital T truths? Maybe we need to read some of this philosophy of science work. So I thought that was interesting. So you can thank Paul later for being on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess I kind of, uh, agree with Paul, um, but you know the way that we study motivation, um, I think lent, lent, um, lends itself more toward absolute scientism versus culturalism. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a really difficult sort of uh, continuum to think about. The, the best way that I can think of it is we're really different in our similarities, and that's just the best way that I can think about it. You know, um, just sort of playing around with this analogy of, um, of a suit. And um, motivation is like a, a, a well-tailored suit, in a sense. So there's some aspects that are like capital T truths or generalizable regarding a suit, like they have to have, you know, um, you know, arm sleeves and so on. But, you know, it has to be tailored um, for the specification of the, the body type that the suit is going on. So we're, we're different in our similarities. There are some things that you know, are, um, I guess, relatively universal across us, but even those things are very different. I, I think also about self-determination theory, you know, competence, autonomy, relatedness. Um, those are like the off-the-rack model. To me, like I'm taking a suit <laughs> off the rack, competence, autonomy, relatedness. Yeah, that'll fit most people, you know, but it still needs to be tailored in specific ways for the specific students that are in front of you as a teacher. Yep. This is really important that you know we definitely should be having more in, in, in an essay. I just don't happen to do work on that population, particularly at, at, at in, in college of ed. At, we have hardly any Asian students at all in my college at, at NC State. Now, outside of my college, particularly in um, Ms. Nichols, we can applaud. But um, you know, some of the other, some of the other college, particularly, you know, um, we're still in school, so some of the other colleges we have more Asian students. But in my college, we have hardly any, you know, um, students, uh, Asian students. So pretty much, it's pretty much mostly white students and black students. So once again, I'm from the south. And so I have to put the, the, the context in which I have. Um, so, we, so, I, uh, so unfortunately, I don't necessarily get access to a lot of students outside of white and, and black students, and particularly not even Latinx students. I can't even get access to Latinx students, which is really hard because I was a Spanish major, so that was pretty tough for me. Um, so, I, I, but I definitely think you're right because that brings a whole different conversation. The fact that Asian students are suing, um, you know, uh, or the fact that um, Asian students are included in the non who are yeah. yeah. you know, students. Yeah. They, they're included with the white students and how they have they included. So they're not even included with the other students of color, which is really interesting how other universities include them. So I think that's just really interesting. And I have two Asian students who work closely with me in my research lab who are very unhappy with that categorization, as they should be, because it's marginalizing them and their experience. One's a native-born Kentuckian, first-generation Chinese-American, but Kentuckian <clears throat> from rural Appalachia. <clears throat> you know, how do we how do we represent her experience? And so to to group her with white 
learners is unfair. So they, they've opened my eyes through that as well. I'm glad you raised the point. It's a very important one. Um, as an aside, she has a TED Talk. She just did a TED Talk <laughs> about her identity um, and is a motivation researcher too, so she gave us all a little plug. Um, so that'll be coming out soon. Yen Chen, if you see her tonight at the motivation thing. So uh, yeah. I just wanted to, uh, uh, everyone share their journey and Erica asked me to share mine and I think it's relevant to this comment that was just made. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, I was actually born in Japan and I came to the United States when I was three and a half years old. Um, I don't know if that was, I don't think that was the picture in the airport, but it was around that time <laughs> um, that I came to, to the United States. I grew up on Long Island um, and uh, I was fortunate enough to attend um, uh, both US public, American public schools and probably one of the, the best schools in um, Long Island. Uh, fun fact is that Eric Anderson and I actually went to the same high school, that's the high school there, uh, which we found out years later. Um, but I also, uh, because, you know, there was, uh, became because of my dad's job, and there was always this uh, thing in the back of our, you know, that we might have to move back to Japan at some point, so my parents, uh, uh, you know, now I'm grateful, but at the time I felt forced um, to attend uh, Japanese weekend school. So I went to, you know, U.S. public school Monday to Friday, and then on Saturdays, uh, probably through high school, I went to Japanese school. Um, so I've always felt that I would have, uh, you know, a, you know, I grew up bicultural, right? Um, and when I went to Michigan, um, and I studied with, with you know, uh, Harold Stevenson, who was doing cross-cultural work, uh, Paul uh, Puntrus, as many of you know, and Marty Mayer. Um, I, that's when I, I remember actually sitting in Paul's motivation class and thinking probably what Ron L was thinking too. Like, well, I don't know. <laughs> like, I'm not always approach focused. Uh, you know, sometimes I'm more motivated by a fear of failure, you know, and, and avoidance and this whole avoidance is bad thing. I, I distinctly remember going to Paul and saying, I, this, this, is, this, doesn't, this doesn't make sense to me. And, and I think that's when I also was reading a lot of um, articles at the time that was lumping Asian groups together, you know, East Asians. Uh, who are, you know, so of course Chinese, Japanese, Koreans, all lumped together, um, or, you know, so so that's when I really became more, you know, aware of my own identity and, and also the fact that maybe I had some insights into this issue. So so that's kind of um, um, uh, spurred my initial, uh, um, you know, interests in, in issues of culture. Um, more recently, so now going back to what we were just saying, uh, I'm in New York. Um, I go to, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a faculty member at Fordham University, which is a Jesuit university. We, we hear the word social justice on a daily basis. Um, uh, my research partner, who's sitting back there, and I uh, conduct a lot of studies in New York City public schools. And, and, you know, that's not the environment that I grew up in. And I can't um, say that I fully understand um, of the students that are in some of the schools that we work with. Um, so, you know, uh, this is when, you know, in, in doing this work, I realize my own privilege because I do sometimes feel that, you know, I, I've been, I've, 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 you know, I grew up in, not wealthy, but I wasn't, you know, and I had my experiences in, in terms of prejudice and discrimination, but nothing, nothing to the extent that's what some of these kids uh, in New York City schools face on a daily basis. So, you know, that's where I am right now. You know, I'm kind of like realizing that, yeah, I have some insights, but I also have a lot of blind spots. And, you know, things. So, for what it's worth. But um, I don't want to leave without us talking a little bit more about this issue of equity. Um, so, equity is in the title of um, the symposium, um, and uh, I thought that was interesting. Um, especially uh, if you trace back the history of motivation research, there was actually a fair amount of. Uh, of of um, theorizing on the term equality. In fact, John Nichols has a couple of uh, really interesting articles on that topic. Um, and uh, I was curious, you know, that we, so now we move from equality to equity. Um, I also think that, you know, this, this uh, figure on the, or this figure, picture, <laughs> um, comes from the, uh, you know, has a, has, represents, or defines equity in a certain way. Some people would argue, you know, um, that perhaps our goal should not be equity, but liberation. So I was just curious to see how, or to hear a little bit more about how um, our panelists define the term. Ronell actually already kind of spoke a little bit more to it um, in terms of where, you know, the current work on motivation is in terms of these terms um, and how it fits into issues of equity or liberation or equality. Um, So one of the things that concerns 
concerns me about the lack of addressing of structural racism in culture in our work. It, so I do a lot of work in motivation and motivating people to go into STEM subjects, right? So I want to get people motivated and excited about going into college, going into STEM. And am I just, and if I'm actually successful, and because of structural racism, am I just getting people really excited about going into if I'm not addressing all of that other structural stuff. And how do I include that in my own model or studies? And that's where equity and issues of liberation come into play for me. Is am I just getting people really excited about standing in a hole, staring at the wall? That makes me think of uh, a line in a Maslow text. That's what what shall we think of the well-adjusted slave? Yeah. Um, it's sort of like what should we think if you get someone into the STEM pipeline pathway, call it what you will, into the meat grinder is what you called it. Have we succeeded, or we haven't really succeeded at dismantling the institutions that are oppressive? Yeah, and uh, yeah, I don't have the answer to that. I guess most of us aren't studying that. Um, maybe we're looking at the wrong place. A wise Dr. Schutz once said. <laughs> <laughs> I've been voting yeah. a lot this evening. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you want to join us um, up here? <laughs> <laughs> well, we were chatting earlier, and uh, Paul was uh, raising the said, you know, the most challenging thing for our field is asking good questions. It's not the methods that we should use because the methods follow the good questions, right? They follow naturally from asking the right questions. So I think maybe our questions are bad. Thanks, Paul, for that. <laughs> I think you're right. Um, and maybe this is our challenge. What are the questions around equity, equality um, that we should be asking? This is very hard for me to think. It's hard for me too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I agree, but it's it's the questions and the measures. I mean, I'm thinking about like the history of psychological research and what it was uh, um, intended to do. But really, it's to separate people, evaluate and separate people. So initially, when I was thinking about this, I was like, well, you know, psychology is far from liberation, um, probably closer to equality. But now I'm thinking it's the reality picture. You know, that is really, you know, thinking about um, just old school psychological assessments uh, that are really trying to evaluate differences between people for sorting purposes or a variety of other things. Um, and I think a lot of that is still latent in the measures that um, we use today. Uh, so it, it's definitely an issue of are we asking the right questions, but then once we ask those questions, thinking about what are the tools that we need to really best answer those questions, I guess. Okay, for me, are we trying to just measure it or we want to change it? Because we could measure it all day. I know we already know what it is, but all we're going to do is change it. And so I think, you know, um, to, to, to follow Jennifer's question about, you know, getting people, more people in STEM, we can, you know, we, you know, most of the questions, most of the things we assess whether or not they have the self efficacy and all these different things that get them think that they actually can do well in STEM. But once we get them in STEM, it's where they encounter all the issues. Mm -hmm. But we're not doing anything to change all those issues. And we know that's where the problems are. You know, they're capable, they could do it, they could do STEM, they could have a successful STEM career, but we're not doing anything to change those systemic structural issues. And so we can measure it all day, um, and we know what we're gonna find. So what are we gonna do to change those structural issues? What are we, change, what are we doing to change our individual attitudes about race and you know, and, and, and all these equity issues, whatever the isms are, when you name them, what are we doing to change them? Or, you know, so until we try to address those issues, nothing's gonna change. Now we wanna measure them so we know what they are, you know, you know what level we have so we can change them, and that's different. But, um, you know, so what interventions are we planning on make to make change? This is building on, I mean, everyone in this panel has done such an amazing job at just I don't know, I, I feel like these are such critical issues and I'm curious about, we're talking about systems of oppression. What concrete things would you ask journal editors, 
um, and funders to do in order to make this work happen. Because this work is becoming difficult because there's certain systems of oppression or barriers that are keeping the, you know, keeping the status quo unless we actually do the work recommendations that we have to change, sort of disrupt the system and make the work that you guys are, that, that we all should be doing more easy to approach um, and, and happen with more frequently. I think it's one thing that they could just start publishing the work. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I just came back from my critical race theory um, um, session we had actually about critical race theory and research methods. We're talking about the difficulty we have in publishing in some journals because they just won't publish the work, and so we end up publishing the same places all the time. And so places need to publish the work, um, you know, um, and the funders need to fund the work that actually focuses on on more um, critical approaches, like like Ellen talked about. Uh, she was on this this panel, uh, this grant panel, and they would not, you know, want you know they didn't want to publish them. I'm sorry, probably didn't want to fund certain. Project because of the critical focus they had. Right. And so we need people in those those um, places that are making those important decisions to actually be open to um, funding those kind of projects, to be open to publishing those kind of projects. Because until they're actually seen, people are not going to see that, those issues that's important. So in, in, in that lesson learned that on that panel, um, I realized I needed to use the voice that I have as a white person. Um, and unfortunately, white people listen to white people more than they listen to people of color. That's the reality. So I realized in that space that I needed to use the voice I have to promote change in the funding agency. And I'll read you a, a little bit of the email I sent to everybody at the top of this funding agency after that experience. First, I hope that you will continue to invite scholars of color to the table. It was so important that there were people of color in the room to see things that white people weren't seeing, myself included. I joined in after a while, but I was really slow. Um, and so I, I realized how critical it was. And unfortunate, too, that we burden people of color with having to fight continuously. So that's, that said, we still need people of color at the table. Um, this is what Robin D'Angelo wrote about that. The decisions made at the tables of power in the country affect the lives of those not at the tables. Exclusion by those at the table doesn't depend on willful intent. We don't have to intend to exclude for the results of our actions to be exclusion. Um, if I'm not aware of the barriers you face, then I won't see them, much less be motivated to remove them, nor will I be motivated to remove the barriers if they provide an advantage to which I feel entitled. So, I mean, I think this is, you know, we've got to, have different people at the table. And the second thing I asked them to do was to change their RFAs, their requests for applications, to include a directive that researchers explicitly address diversity and culture in their work. Because it's sort of like the RFA wags the proposal, or whatever, the tail, I don't know. But the proposals are guided by the requests. If funding agencies don't, in, don't, re, don't say, specify, you know, if you say you've got to have a power analysis in your statistical section, people do it. And if you say you've got to at least recognize your positionality of the research team or culture and diversity, then people will do it and they'll start to, okay, they might not like it, they probably won't like it. But they'll at least start to do that and acknowledge their non-neutrality um, in the situation. How do I avoid being perceiving myself or being perceived by others as a white savior? Is it enough just to acknowledge my positionality, acknowledge my privilege and my background? It's something that I just feel I dance around with and have never felt really good about how I address it. I just felt gross, I, I felt gross reading that email to you right now, because I feel like that's exactly the way I'm trying to position my, it might have come across that way. What are we gonna do about it? I mean, you gotta take a step and take a risk and put yourself out there. And be open to hearing someone say, you know, you're not, you're not saving me. Yeah, it's about being authentic. Um, you know, authentic, um, talking, listening to scholars of color, listening to, experiences, um, being willing to learn about from experiences, and um, 
you know, you feel like, hey, you're already going to those sessions and listen to those sessions, and then eventually, you, you, you know, you'd be welcome to, into those groups and those spaces, and people see you and they recognize you, and they know, okay, she's just an ally, and then over time, but it's, it, it, it takes time to be in those spaces. So um, I've said this last year at a panel similar to this, I'll say it again. So um, a couple of points that came up in my mind, one was the gatekeepers that you brought up, which I appreciate, because I feel like the gatekeepers gatekeep the conversation, and we don't acknowledge it enough. And so we talked about one of the things, the reviewers, for example, could be attending these sessions and be more understanding of these issues. The second point that comes to mind is qualitative research, and as well as descriptive studies. We pay lip service to it, but I don't think we do them justice because if we're to understand the cultures and the groups and whether we box them or we don't box them or we overlap them, we don't know what they look like and we don't know how they behave and we don't describe them. And the first thing we say when we talk to our students is define your construct. And yet we can't define those stories because we don't embrace qualitative research. Or if we do, they're not published in the journals that we tend to embrace, right? As like a prestigious journal that'll get your career. So if you're talking about how do you cultivate the new generation of researchers, I think there's words that are being said, which I appreciate, but at the same time, culturally, I think even within our stick, because I've been coming, like you said, since 2007, and yet I feel like I'm one of the lone voices like saying this until today, like this happens, and I'm like, whoa, great. Um, <laughs> but it's not happening, right? And it gets exhausting when it's the same thing over and over. And um, my another question I came up with regards to open, with regards to your gatekeepers item is open access journals versus subscription. So there's all these wonderful plethora of scholars out there who probably can't publish their voices to be shared with the rest of us because of subscription issues. So I mean, again, for people who are more senior to us, maybe these are things I should be thinking about. Open access journals, for example, gives access to a whole lot of people, but maybe they're not ranked as high. And then what does that mean for young motivation scholars who are trying to get tenure and they need to have their, you know, publications look good, right? So, I, I mean, I'm bringing up really complicated questions, I recognize it, but at the same time, I feel like not enough is being, at least it's not being conversed about publicly. Um, and even thinking about who gets access into most big sessions, I recognize they're competitive, but for example, we don't see a lot of qualitative, nor do we see a lot of like descriptive type population level posters, sessions, any of those, and I think more of that could be done. And I say that as a reviewer myself who rarely sees these come across my lap when I review these submissions. One, um, I was a recent associate editor at the ARJ. Julie was a, a head editor. She, she brought me on the team. And one thing that, you know, she brought me on the team, she brought uh, Francesca on the team, so brought more um, uh, scholars of color on the team, so I definitely want to thank Julie for for her leadership there, but also one thing that I try to do particularly is to bring more um, scholars of color on the editorial board. And so, you know, that's one thing that I had a goal for, and so I got more of, you know, and I brought more uh, scholars, scholars to actually review the articles that I was sending out. So that was one thing that I at least tried to do in terms of scholarship there. So making sure I was a gatekeeper and bringing out more scholars in the community. Um, and so in terms of the research and qualitative, you're right, that there's not a lot of positive work in, in the motivation state. And one thing that I've had to do to for my career, I've actually actually published in multiple areas. And so I've kind of had my one leg in the, in the quicker race theory camp over here and doing all that kind of stuff over there, and then one leg over here in the where it's like it's kind of whatever. So I've kind of had to do double duty, duty my whole career. And so it's just really refreshing for me, like, oh wow, so it's like not talking about race stuff. So now I'm trying to bring all that stuff over here <laughs> for me. So I can talk to one audience instead of talking to two audiences like my whole career. Um, and so, really, it was a double burden, particularly for, for mm -hmm. certain scholars to have to kind of do that and kind of keep up with two sets of people, two yeah. sets of networks, two sets of, you know, getting to know the, the, the senior scholars. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of work to have to do, particularly as a uh, assistant professor. I'm a full professor now, but to kind of, uh, you know, rise in the ranks to have to do that. Yeah. Um, but it's a lot of work. Has have any concluding comments or questions for for our, our field. We have a lot of good uh, suggestions that I think we really need to think about seriously, um, both within the SIG and in the field more broadly, I think. But, um, or any last, one last question? Yeah. Yeah, I'm kind of echoing kind of what's been said this whole time. First off, it's really a great panel, but one thing that I think we've done a really bad job of, and Jamal talked about this, is our measures. 
um, basically all been validated in white samples. And we do a really bad job of checking to see whether people in other cultures and race and ethnicity are interpreting these items in the same way. And so I just want to you know, challenge everyone here to think about that when we're giving these measures to people and, and we're touting, oh, we got a really diverse sample, but we don't know if they're actually reading these items in the same way that they were validated in. Um, and so any suggestions that you all might have on how we can do a better job of making sure that our measures are actually appropriate for different samples. Yeah, I just think that ties into the comment regarding um, qualitative work and different types of methods. So, you know, a lot of measures that are created start with, you know, focus groups, interviews, so on, and then the you know, more survey type measures created. And so for, I think for a lot of the measures that we already use, we kind of need to go back to that drawing board and that's why, um, you know, qualitative interviewing and um, all of these non-traditional um, methods within motivational research become um, important. Again, I think if you look at, um, you know, some of the work presented on this panel, you see uh, some uh, analyses um, some uh, methods that you don't typically see, you know, in your typical uh, motivation paper or even motivation panel, because we, in a way, we have to really go back to the drawing board um, for a lot of these things to uh, get at the heart of what these experiences were like for uh, traditionally marginalized groups. Thank you, uh, You know, I hope we get to keep continuing this conversation and continue to more, uh, both informally and also formally, <laughs> hopefully through our journal publications in our future. But um, I just again want to thank uh, the panelists and, and Erica and the SIG Motivation for this, um, um, for this opportunity to, to talk about this. So, yeah.